Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see three of you join class today. Uh, not sure what happened to the rest. Uh, do you think we should wait a couple more minutes uh, for the others to join or should we begin class? Should we wait for, uh, now four of you are here, five, okay. We just wait for one or two more minutes so more of them can join and then uh, we'll begin class. Is it fine with all of you if you can wait for a couple more minutes or do you think I should begin class? No answers? I think we can start first. Okay, we'll start? Okay. Okay, let's begin. Uh, can I ask uh, Rosalind to just lead us in prayer, please? Rosalind? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Father God. Wonderful, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for this day. Thank you for this beautiful morning, Lord. Even as we have gathered here to learn from your word, Father God, we ask you to please help us, Lord. Help us through your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, Father God. Please guide us as we go through your word. Give us the understanding. Let the spirit of revelation be released in this place for each and every one of us to grasp what we learn and to and to and to study it and and apply it in our daily lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus, so we be able to teach others also. Father God, I also pray for our dear pastor, anoint her, Lord, this morning as she teaches us, Lord. It's not her, but the Holy Spirit through her. Thank you, Lord God. Bless all the children who have joined and, and those uh, who are yet to join. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. Uh, so last week, uh, remember what we were studying about? Last Wednesday and Friday, what did we study on? Which doctrine did we study? Uh, justification and sanctification. Thank you. Uh, yes, we studied about justification and uh, sanctification. So what is justification? For those of you who can't, uh, uh, you know, unmute your mics and answer, please feel free to type your answers in the chat section. So what does justification mean? The term justification or what does the doctrine of justification mean? Justification means God makes us just as we, we have never sinned through the work of the cross. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Uh, John, uh, we, uh, justification is, uh, you know, because of Christ's work, the finished work of Christ on the cross, God the Father sees us just as if we have never sinned. Okay? It's because of Christ's work on the cross that uh, we are acquitted, we are declared as not guilty, uh, we are completely forgiven uh, uh, by the Father, we are seen by him just as if we have never sinned, and uh, you know we are made innocent. Okay, So that is... Uh, uh, happens the moment we uh, ask Jesus uh, to forgive our sins and be the Lord and Savior of our life. So it's an instantaneous legal act uh, when God considers us as forgiven uh, because of Christ's righteousness that uh, belongs to us, that has been imputed upon us or put, <coughs> sorry, put into our account. Okay, And uh, we are declared righteous in God's sight. 
Then we looked at uh, some of the practical implications of justification. And uh, then we looked at the doctrine of uh, sanctification. So what is sanctification? It's a progressive work of God in our life. Okay, it's the progressive work of God in our life. Uh, what is the work? What is the progressive work? So progressive work, so what is God's work in our life? Is there any work to be done because Christ has already made the full sufficient per a sacrifice for our sins? He has, uh, you know, uh, and we are declared uh, not, gil we get not guilty. We are declared forgiven. Uh, we are seen just as if we have never sinned. Everything is completed. There's no more, uh, you know, work of salvation that needs to be done. It's all completed by Jesus. Then uh, what is this uh, progressive work? Uh, according to my understanding, like uh, uh, we have a born again spirit, but our flesh is not born again. So we need to align our flesh uh, according to the spirit by walking in the spirit and God spirit working us to become just like him. So it's a progressive work. Thank you. Yes, Silatoli. So when we are born again, we are made new in our spirit man. But, uh, you know, uh, we live in the same body and uh, our soul is the same. And, uh, of course, when we are born again, you know, the power of sin is rendered to be broken, uh, has no control over our lives. But then, uh, you know, we can uh, tend to... Uh, you know, uh, to give into our carnal fleshly nature. And Paul writes about this and says, you know, there's a war that rages in us uh, between the flesh and the spirit. And, uh, you know, uh, we can, our soul and our bodies can uh, tend to incline to give into our old sinful habits, uh, sinful, lustful passions. And uh, hence, we, um, you know, we need to work out our salvation daily. And, uh, uh, you know, so sanctification is a continuous work uh, compared to justification where it is, uh, you know, a one-time thing that happens the moment we've accepted Jesus. But sanctification is something progressive. It happens uh, throughout our lifetime. Um, so uh, we see that sanctification requires both, uh, you know, the work of God in our life and even our participation. Okay. So it's, um, uh, it's um, Christ's work in us, the work of the Holy Spirit in us, but also requires our uh, participation. So what is, uh, how can we, you know, there are two aspects we saw about sanctification, about our role in sanctification, about us being active and passive. So what is a passive role? What is a passive role of sanctification? Because Jesus has finished the work for our sanctification, we live out of that revelation. Okay, thank you. We live out of that revelation. Uh, we also trust God for and thank God for what he has done, what he's purchased for us, uh, you know, uh, and we pray and ask him to sanctify us. So it's, uh, uh, you know, it's a prayer that we offer daily, asking him to sanctify us, okay? And also, what is the active role? Active role is how we work out our salvation in daily life. Yes, uh, thank you, John. So here we take an active part in saying no to the deeds of the flesh, putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Uh, like Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 13, uh, those choices we need to make. We know that God is sovereign. Uh, but in his sovereignty, he's given us, uh, you know, free will to choose. So we can choose uh, whether we want to do what is right or whether we want to do what is wrong. You know, so every minute or, uh, you know, every hour we're making so many choices. Whether we need to say that, we need to react in the same way, we need to think in the same way. 
uh, you know, uh, our attitudes, our actions, our reactions, our behavior, our choices that we make, the way we need to watch something or not. So there's constant choices that we make and we need to constantly put to death the deeds of the <clears throat> flesh. Even if uh, times when, you know, um, when we are, um, uh, you know, we are hurt and we want to retaliate, uh, but we need to make a choice that, uh, you know, we don't give in to anger and uh, uh, hatred and bitterness. We don't let that rule in our hearts. We just, uh, you know, let go, forgive the person. Uh, we don't do tit for that. We uh, don't take revenge. Uh, so all of these things are choices that we make on a day-to-day -day basis. And it is continually putting to death the deeds of the flesh and, uh, you know, choosing uh, to um, follow, uh, you know, um, what God has uh, asked us to live according to uh, the spirit-filled um, nature, put on the spirit man that is uh, put on the fruits of the spirit or let the fruit of the spirit uh, be activated in our lives um, consciously, you know, uh, uh, loving people, you know, being kind, gentle, patient, uh, uh, you know, have, exercising self-control. So these are the things that uh, will, you know, we can bear this fruit only when we allow the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to the extent that we are sanctified to that extent that we can, uh, you know, bear the fruit of the Spirit or the fruit of the Spirit will be seen uh, in our lives, will just be manifested. So we don't have to work on basically, you know, uh, uh, you know, manifesting the fruits, it will just be automatic once we are abiding in the vine, uh, once we have a constant communion and fellowship with Jesus Christ, and we allow, uh, we are sanctifying ourselves every day, we are consecrating the members of our body every day, to that extent, we are being sanctified, made holy, and, uh, you know, uh, we will bear the fruits of the uh, spirit. Okay, so it's putting to death the deeds of the flesh, Romans 8.13. Um, and also we need to renew our minds uh, daily, be transformed by the renewing of our minds uh, because uh, the battle is in our minds. And, uh, you know, the word of God says that we have the mind of Christ um, and we can, you know, uh, pray and ask God for the mind of Christ, but we need to also work uh, in the area of our mental faculties. You know, uh, the word of God says, whatever is true, whatever is right, noble, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, think about such things, okay? So God cannot think for us. We need to think of all of these things. So we need to choose if this thought is right or wrong. If it's wrong, we just throw it out uh, and we dwell on what is right, whatever is true, whatever is noble, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent and praiseworthy. We dwell on such kind of thoughts. So it's constantly choices that we make even in the area of our mind. So we're being renewed in our minds. And that is also something uh, that requires our active participation. So it's not just praying and say, okay, God, I just consecrate this whole day, I consecrate my whole life, uh, my mind, my spirit, my body. Uh, do as you will and please, uh, you know, we can pray that. But when it comes to actually uh, uh, being in a position where we need to make the choice, we need to ask the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, what you need, what uh, what choice do I need to make? But we, at uh, times when we know what is the right choice we need to make, you know, uh, we need to, you know, uh, uh, choose that irrespective of how we feel, uh, putting away our emotions, our anger, our bitterness, our, uh, uh, you know, our uh, thoughts that are going against uh, uh, what God wants us to do and choose to do what is right in uh, the eyes of God and honor him and uh, that when that's when the sanctification process uh, we are helping the holy spirit and also working along with him uh, in the sanctification process okay we looked at um, uh, at um, the three stages of uh, sanctification we saw that sanctification has a definite beginning uh, it uh, it happens the the moment that we are born again uh, it also happens throughout our lifetime uh, uh, we, I don't know if you read Second Corinthians chapter three, verse eighteen, um, and um, 
uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. So can one of you please read 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, please? And someone else can read Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Second Corinthians 3, 18. Second. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror of the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Thank you. So here we see that, uh, you know, uh, why is sanctification, the process of sanctification happening throughout our life? It's because we are being transformed into the same image of Christ from glory to glory. You know, God created us uh, to manifest his glory here on earth. And uh, that was marred because of sin. And so here is uh, the process that is, uh, you know, transforming us uh, into his image, into his likeness, being like Christ uh, in our attitude. We are being changed into his image from glory to uh, glory and that is why it happens throughout our life and it also says the sanctification increases throughout our life so it does not automatically increase but it depends upon us to the extent that we are allowing the Holy Spirit is that extent will be increasing and we will just be moving from glory to glory Philippians chapter 3 verse 13 and 14 can one of you read that please Philippians chapter 3 verses 13 and 14 Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. 14. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Thank you. So, um, you know, Paul is talking about his experience here and he's saying that, uh, you know, he's just uh, forgetting about everything that has happened in the past. But, uh, you know, he's uh, moving towards, reaching towards the things that are ahead uh, of him, that Christ has, uh, uh, you know, has uh, purposed for him. And, uh, you know, he's looking forward to the goal that he has and not looking behind. So even as, uh, you know, we might, all of us have a past, uh, you know, but um, as we are born again, a uh, new creation in Christ Jesus, uh, Satan will always keep reminding us of our past, which will make us feel guilty, shameful, uh, sinful. But uh, we need to, you know, uh, you know, let go of our past and look ahead. Uh, and that's why Paul says, you know, running with perseverance, the race that is marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author, perfecter, and the finisher of our um, race. So you can't run your race, you know, when you, when you look back because it will cut your speed, but you need to be focused on your goal. So if the goal of our uh, existence is... Uh, not only just to fulfill the purpose of God, but in the process of fulfilling God's purpose, you know, um, uh, we are here to manifest His glory, and we can manifest His glory in a uh, uh, in, in a in a in a greater way, on a good way, on a in the way that will uh, make God known uh, is when we are our lives show forth Christ's likeness in um, in the way that we live in the way that we talk, in the way that we move. So uh, so that is what Paul is saying, you know, that must be more like Christ. And that's why he says, he writes, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And uh, uh, that has been his goal, to be like Christ. Okay, and that can happen to the only when the work of sanctification, the work of the Holy Spirit uh, is active in our lives. And it can be only active when we are willing to consecrate every area, uh, you know, hand over our weaknesses, our frailties, our areas of temptation, and uh, just work along with God to honor him uh, in everything that we Okay, so sanctification increases throughout our life. Colossians chapter 3 says, uh, 3 verse 10 says, and have put on the new man who is renewed. Okay, so it 
It says who is renewed. So uh, it is in the knowledge according or according to the image of him who created uh, him. Okay. So it says we put on the new man who is renewed. Okay. So the uh, new man is being renewed. Once uh, people think that we've you know, receive salvation, uh, you know, it's a great thing because we're, we have a place in heaven, uh, we're going there and we can live as we want. And so sad to see many Christians who say they are born again, but their lives do not reflect, um, uh, you know, Christ-likeness or um, uh, they are no way different from, uh, you know, a common uh, worldly person a person who is an unbeliever. So here it says that our new man needs to be renewed. Uh, renewed is not is something made new. It's a process that happens. It's being made new every moment, every minute, every hour, every day. Um, so we need to be renewed in our inner man. Okay. And the third step of sanctification is that sanctification is completed uh, when the Lord returns or when we go to be with the uh, Lord. So, uh, there are three, uh, two references there. Philippians chapter 3. Can one of you please read Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21? And 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23 and 49, please. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. But our citizenship in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. 21. Who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like glorious bodies. Thank you. So we have this hope that our uh, lowly bodies uh, will be transformed into glorious bodies. Uh, that is a future eschatological hope that we have. Uh, but here Paul says that our citizenship is in heaven. So we are not uh, permanent earthly citizens. Our citizenship is in heaven. Once we've accepted Jesus Christ, we're citizens of heaven. And hence we need to live here on earth like citizens of heaven. And we can only do that, uh, you know, when uh, we allow uh, the Holy Spirit to work in our lives and sanctify us and make us holy. First Corinthians 15, 23 and 49. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23 and 49. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Verse 49. And as we have borne the image of man of dust, we shall also bear the image of heavenly man. Thank you. So um, we see that... Uh, you know, uh, just like um, Christ, you know, when he rose up uh, from the dead, you know, he had uh, a glorified body. It was not a body with weaknesses, frailties. Uh, we looked at it in uh, the Christology class on Monday, uh, but it's new glorified bodies. And we also have that hope that uh, we who are uh, having bodies that are corruptible will be raised incorruptible, uh, bodies that are perishable will be raised imperishable, uh, bodies that are weak will be raised in uh, glory. Okay, so that is a hope that we have, uh, and because Christ, who is the first fruit of uh, of those who have resurrected from the dead, okay, and so also, uh, you know, when we uh, uh, those of us who believe in Christ, you know, when we rise again, we will be uh, risen in this new glorious uh, 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 spiritual bodies. Uh, and thus, you no, know, there's no need for the work of sanctification. Uh, the sanctification work is completed uh, because uh, when the Lord returns, we will be with him. Uh, we will go to be with him in our glorified uh, bodies, in our spiritual bodies, and no longer in our natural bodies. Okay, so we see that the process of sanctification is uh, the Lord begins to work, uh, but it also has man's role. Okay, so this was what we looked at um, uh, on Friday in our class. Uh, just going, was going, uh, just thought I'll do a, a, a recap of it uh, because we didn't have time to read a couple of uh, scripture passages. Um, so I thought I'll just um, 
you know, do a recap and also get us to see those scripture passages. Today we'll be looking at uh, the doctrine of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Uh, the doctrine of Christ is something that, uh, you know, we'll be looking at. Okay, when we're studying the doctrine of Christ, what will we be basically studying about? When we're studying the doctrine of Christ, what do you think we'll be studying about? Ma'am, about Jesus Christ, his nature of working, his characteristics. Uh, you said his nature of working and his characteristics, okay? Anyone else has any idea about what we'll be studying about the doctrine of Christ? We'll be basically studying about the person of Jesus Christ. So when we're studying about the person of Jesus Christ, uh, you know, we're basically looking at uh, him as a person, how he was fully God and fully uh, man, or how uh, deity and humanity coexisted in perfect unity in the person of uh, Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, so we have already studied about this. Uh, so maybe you all have to teach or uh, maybe you all have to, uh, you know, share the points because we've studied quite in depth about this in uh, Christology when we studied about uh, the deity of Christ uh, in the pre-incarnation, incarnation, uh, the virginal uh, 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 conception of Christ. We looked at the humanity of Christ. So uh, we spent quite, uh, I think, two months almost uh, looking at uh, uh, you know, how Jesus was fully God and how he's fully man. Okay, so I think all of you need to uh, share now on the humanity of Christ and the deity of Christ. Is that fine? Yeah, because we've already uh, studied about it. Uh, you had um, uh, your first assessment on the first uh, three or four chapters. So are you ready to share your uh, inputs and on the humanity of Christ, what we learned in the incarnation of Christ, the virginal conception. Um, we, uh, we studied also about uh, how he was fully God and fully man in Christology, right? The same thing that we will be looking at here in um, Doctrinal Foundations. So, yes, I'll open this time up to all of you to share uh, what you have been learning about uh, the incarnation of Christ, how Christ was was fully God and fully man, and how he coexisted in one person, Jesus Christ. No one wants to share? Well, we've been studying uh, quite in depth about this. So quite a, a lot of repetitions that we've been seeing. Right. Can I share something? Sure, Isaac. Okay, we, we learned that um, Christ was the Word in, and he was with God before even he came to earth as human. He was God and he was with God. That is, he existed before time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Isaac. Anyone else? Yes, go ahead, Lubega. Uh, Pastor, we, di we, we discussed about Christ being the Logos. And when I was doing a research on the word Logos in one of the Bible dictionaries, I really found out that... Um, the word logos is like an expressed idea of God in in a human being. I re realized that Christ, as a, uh, as our Savior, he he was a person who came on earth through a virgin birth. That is in his humanity, but he existed before before the universe started because he is in the. Deathless past and is in the deathless future. He's 
he has always been here and he will be here even before after we are gone because even in hebrews 13 8 it says jesus christ was the same yesterday today and forever so he is our savior he was sinless he was here and he was born through a virgin birth and he died for our sins on the cross and uh, he also resurrected to to go and be a mediator and a, a mediator on our part and he's sitting on the right hand of the father that's what i can say pastor thank you Thank you. Thank you, Lubega. Anyone else would like to share what we learned in Christology? Christology, we had looked at the pre-existence of Christ. So we looked at the role in creation. Uh, we understood the creation. We looked at the humanity of Christ, the virginal conception. So you'll remember anything about uh, Christ, how he was fully God and fully man. We looked at uh, the deity of Christ and we saw that uh, we looked at John chapter 1 verses 1 to 4. Uh, the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things were made uh, through him. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and the life was the light of uh, men. So we saw that this word is the Logos. Uh, and that refers to Jesus Christ, who existed not only before he came into this world, but he was uh, before all time. He was not just in the beginning, but also in the beginning uh, and before the beginning. Um, hence, he was, uh, you know, there was never a time when he was not. There will never be a time when he will cease to exist. He was with God the Father and the Holy Spirit. Uh, we also saw that Jesus is God because he has the same essence, so he possessed the essence, which means he had the, uh, you know, the substance of all that make God, God. Uh, so hence he is God himself and he, in him was life. So the Greek word we spoke about there was about the zoe life, uh, which means uh, uh, the God kind of life, which is uh, God is self-existent, self-sustaining, uh, you know, uh, 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 and a eternal, he has eternal life and we see the same life in Jesus Christ and uh, he has the zoe life. Uh, he is not just having the Zoe life or the life of God, but he is uh, uh, his life himself. That's what he says in John chapter 14, verse 6. Uh, Jesus declares that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay. So we looked at uh, also the nature and the attributes um, of Jesus. Uh, we saw that. Uh, you know, um, he was having the very nature of God, uh, the, the, the word uh, nature or being is the word form of God, uh, substance, he had the divine qualities, the divine substance, all that makes God, God. Uh, we also saw that, uh, that Jesus declaring that, uh, you know, uh, in John chapter 8, verse 58, he says, before Abraham uh, was, I am. Okay, so he uses that word, I am, and we know that I am was uh, the word that was, uh, uh, you know, God of the Old Testament, God the Father uh, uh, ascribed to himself. Uh, we also saw the meaning of the word um, I am, uh, and we also looked at, um, uh, you know, we saw the humanity of Jesus Christ as well. Uh, anyone remembers about what we learned about the humanity of Jesus Christ? Or his incarnation? Like uh, the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. Okay. Somebody had their hand up? No? Okay. What did we learn about uh, uh, the incarnation of Jesus Christ? We, remember we learned the seven steps in the incarnation? Anyone remembers which uh, chapter at least in the Bible or which book and which chapter in the Bible we looked at the seven steps of incarnation? Uh, 
Philippians chapter 2. Uh, thank you, John. Yes, it's Philippians chapter 2. Sorry, Zilatoli. Yes, go ahead, please. Christ was in the form of God, and also Christ was equal with God. And like uh, he made himself of no reputation. Yeah, these three things I remember. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, both of you. Yes, we looked at seven steps of incarnation. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 8, we saw that Christ was in the form of God. He was equal with God. He did not consider it to be robbery uh, with uh, to be equal with God. He made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a bond servant. Uh, he came in the likeness of man and he also found, he was found in the appearance as man. So we saw that he had the form of God. He was equal with God. Um, you know, we saw that even though Jesus was co-equal with God, uh, he gave up his right to be honored, to be worshipped as uh, uh, God. He did not hold on to that glorious estate and that privilege. Um, he made himself of no uh, reputation. Um, we saw that he refrained from exercising uh, or expressing of his divine attributes that was his omnipotence omniscience and uh, that he was omnipresence his omnipresence okay that uh, he gave up uh, he did not give up but he refrained willingly refrained from exercising uh, uh, these divine attributes and he laid aside his position of being equal with uh, uh, God and we we also learned that he took upon he, uh, the glory of the sonship glory uh, so he had uh, no glory that was he had uh, held on prior uh, to him becoming a human being that was the glory of uh, of God uh, he gave up that glory he had uh, took on himself the uh, the sonship glory but we see that after he rose again and he ascended back to the father he was restored back to his former glory of uh, uh, what he had even before the uh, his incarnation or even before the creation of his of the world okay then we see that he took on the form of a bond servant uh, uh, you know, he left his place of equality with the father and, and took on the state of uh, a servant. That means humbling himself, uh, willing to do the will of the father, willing to do what uh, his father wanted him to do. And we see Jesus uh, continually saying in the Gospels that he came to do the will of the father. Uh, we read this in John chapter 5 verse 30. Uh, and we see that he came in the likeness of men. He was like us. Uh, he limited himself to, uh, uh, you know, uh, human frailties, uh, weaknesses. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, he was found as the appearance as man. Okay. So we see, uh, we had looked at all of this in... Um, uh, in Christology, we looked at his uh, humanity as well. So in your notes here, um, you know, we basically are going to look at uh, uh, the virgin birth, uh, two points, virgin birth of Christ and human weaknesses and uh, limitations. Of course, uh, this is a very uh, concise um, notes here. It's because we've already uh, studied about this in detail in uh, Christology. So all of the points are not being mentioned here. Uh, so I like you all to reiterate, uh, you know, to think about what we had learned in Christology. Maybe you can go back and refer to those uh, notes. But it's important for us to know about, uh, you know, how uh, deity and humanity coexisted in perfect unity, in perfect oneness in the person of Jesus Christ. So here in your notes, uh, in Doctrinal Foundations, uh, you know, uh, we look at the humanity of Christ, two points. One is this virgin birth, and the second thing is human weaknesses and uh, limitations. So can one of you please read Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, verse 20 and 24 to 25. That is Matthew chapter 1, verses 18, verse 20, and verses 24 to 25. Matthew 
chapter 1 verse 20 but after but was 18 uh sita can you can you please read 18 first then 20 and then 24 to 25 please okay ma'am thank you chapter 1 verse 18 this is how the birth of jesus christ came about his mother mary was pledged to be married to joseph but before they came together she was found to be with the child through the holy spirit 20 but after he had considered this an angel of the lord appeared to him in a dream and said joseph son of david do not be afraid to take mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her womb is from holy spirit 21 she will give birth to a son and you are to give him name jesus because he will save his people from their sins 24 when joseph woke up he did what the angel of the lord had commanded him and took mary home as his wife 25 yes please but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and he gave and he gave him the name jesus thank you so uh, in these uh, verses that were read uh, you know uh, we need to note these important uh, uh, phrases or statements uh, you know mary was betrothed uh, to joseph but before they came together this is before they uh, were united as husband and wife before they came together mary was found with child by the power of the holy spirit okay she was found to be with child of the holy spirit so the first phrase we need to send is before they came together second one is uh, of the holy spirit we read that in matthew chapter 1 was 18 um and then we read in matthew chapter 1 was 20 for that which is conceived in her is of the holy spirit so this is what the angel is telling joseph what is conceived in mary is uh, by the holy spirit by the power of the holy uh, spirit and uh, we read in was 24 and 25 that um, even though uh, joseph took mary as his wife but he did not know her until she had uh, born a son and they called his name jesus okay so the doctrinal importance of the virgin birth uh, we've learned a lot about uh, the virginal conception uh, but we look at uh, three important points here uh, in the doctrinal importance of virgin birth the three areas it first of all uh, we see that salvation is not the work of man man cannot do anything to save himself uh, cannot pay the penalty for his sins there's no way he can pay uh, the debt for uh, the sin, for sin or uh, do anything to take away the punishment for sin so salvation is not the work of man but uh, it's it's also not uh, it can no way be any human effort but it is completely uh the work of god it is his doing his complete work his complete act uh and we see that uh god brought it about by his own power um uh, and it's not by any human effort not by any human will uh, uh or uh, you know uh, human beings having to do anything uh, hand in it as well so it's a reminder that salvation can never come Uh, through human effort but it is purely the work of god him uh, self so the virgin birth shows us or proves this to us the second thing is that um because of the virgin birth you know uh, 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 full humanity and full deity could coexist in uh, the person of uh, jesus christ and uh, the third thing is that the virgin birth made it possible uh that yeah, that even though christ was born uh through a woman but not in uh, uh you know uh, uh through human uh, union of a man and a woman and hence he inherited no sin 
all of us, uh, you know, uh, are sinful from the time that we are conceived in our mother's womb, with, with the time we are born, is because of the union that is there between a man and a woman. But uh, here we see there is no union, and hence uh, Christ uh, had inherited no sin, uh, but all of us have inherited sin of our fathers, of our forefathers, right up uh, uh, to uh, Adam. Uh, uh, and since uh, Jesus did not descend, uh, uh, you know, uh, from the lineage of Adam in the way that we, or in the way that rest of the human mankind came into being, he inherited no sin. Okay. Though he, the genealogy, yes, uh, you know, Joseph was in the line, uh, was, uh, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the line of uh, Adam, but we see that because um, uh, they did not have any union, there was no sin that was inherited, uh, that Jesus did not inherit any sin. Um, and hence he was uh, fully human, but uh, fully sinless as well. So it was through the miraculous work and the power of the Holy Spirit that prevented uh, him, uh, you know, uh, uh, being sinless, even though he was born just like any other. Uh, uh, I mean, he went through the whole nine month period of uh, being in the in the mother's uh, womb and being born as a baby. But uh, uh, you know, the, the part, because he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, it prevented the transmission of sin from Mary uh, to the Lord Jesus. Okay. And so here we see that uh, the virginal conception brought shows us that, uh, you know, um, salvation is the work of God. Uh, and it was uh, also possible that full humanity and full deity could coexist in the person of Jesus Christ and also it made possible that Christ though he was fully human he did not inherit sin okay the second thing is that uh, he had human weaknesses and limitations uh, we see that uh, Jesus was you know uh, full term uh, in the mother's womb nine months he was born he was born as a baby he grew up he was a child he grew into adulthood and uh, we read in the gospels uh, instances uh, which talk about his birth uh, his being a baby and being a, a child and also numerous uh, uh, you know narratives that we read about uh, his adulthood we also see that uh, Jesus became you know uh, you know he had human and frailties, weaknesses. Uh, he was tired. He was hungry. He was thirsty. Uh, uh, we read about him being tired at um, uh, in John chapter four, verse forty. Uh, John chapter four, verse six. Uh, you know when he came to Jacob's well just before he met the Samaritan woman. Uh, it says that Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, or uh, you know, Jesus sat at Jacob's well as he was very tired from his uh, journey. We also read uh, in the Gospels that Jesus was um, hungry. Uh, Mark chapter eleven. We see that, uh, you know, the next day as they were leaving to Bethany, Jesus and his disciples, Jesus was hungry and he saw a fig tree uh, with leaf on it from a distance. And when he went near it, he found no fruit. And we know what happened because the uh, fig tree. Uh, we read about him being hungry even in Matthew chapter 4. Uh, what do we read about in Matthew chapter 4? What is the narrative in Matthew chapter 4? The temptation of Jesus. Thank you, Sinatoli. Temptation of Jesus. Yes, Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And it says that he was hungry. Um, we also see that he died. He died on the cross. Um, uh, he ceased, uh, his human body ceased to have life and it ceased to function. We read about this in Matthew chapter 27, uh, verse 50. It says again, Jesus cried out loudly and then he uh, died. Okay, and uh, we also know that Jesus uh, rose again from the dead in a physical human body. Um, but uh, we know that uh, though he had the physical human body, it was a body not subject to weaknesses and frailties and sicknesses and pain, but it was one that was perfect and no longer subject to weaknesses, disease, or death. 
um, uh, Luke chapter 24, verse uh, 39, or we'll look at it in the next class. Uh, but uh, remember, I, I spoke about this on Monday, that even though Jesus had uh, was resurrected in a physical human body, uh, but was his, uh, his resurrection was different from uh, that of Lazarus or Jairus, um, whom he had resurrected from the Jairus' daughter, whom he had resurrected from the dead, but they lived in the same bodies that were weak and frail and they died again but uh, Jesus is the first fruits of those who has risen from the dead in terms of you know he did not have that natural human body but now he had a glorified spiritual uh, body which did bear the marks and the scars of the wounds that he uh, paid for us on the cross and I also said it does not mean that when we are uh, given that glorified bodies uh, when we will rise up uh, from the dead uh, we will bear no marks or scars just like Jesus did but Jesus chose to have that on his body okay so we look at it uh, further on Friday um, we'll stop now anyone has any questions any doubts Okay, if there are no questions, no doubts, so if you have any, we can answer them on class in, on Friday. Um, thank you all for joining class. Um, uh, have a good day ahead, and I'll see you on Friday. Thank you.